All right. Hello, willkommen, bienvenue, konnichiwa. It's time for the Amish Inquisition yet again, episode 178 on Sunday, the 4th of April, Easter Sunday. I'm Amish Phil. I'm Amish Ben. I'm Amish Matt. And tonight's guest is Egyptologist and author David Roll. How are we doing, David? I'm, I'm Amish David. I'm doing <laughs> fine, thank you very much. <laughs> Good to have you. I've got a book you always hear on the counter, and you said, don't get that one, it's rubbish. Yeah, I did, actually, yeah. Especially the paperback. At least you could have got the hardback. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking through your, your books and uh, looking at synopsises and whatever, and I thought, cracky, this is right up my alley. Ancient history, theology, sort of alternate timelines. Where, have you, where have you been all my life? Probably working damn hard writing those books, I guess. <laughs> And more to the point is, where have you been during my life? Exactly, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I um, you know, I'm sorry to say I've only recently become familiar with your work and looking forward right. to really getting stuck into it. Oh, well, when were you born? 1983. Oh, uh, well, yeah, you probably were about nine years old when I did my first TV series, so that's probably why you miss me. You're out playing footy all the time. Yes, yeah. Um, I'll, One of the sort of areas of your work that really interests me is this chronology, this alternate chronology uh-huh. with ancient Egypt. So right. could you maybe tell us about that? And uh, so how it differs from the traditional chronology? And Sure. What? Well, I, I started with all this um, when I read a book by Professor Kenneth Kitchen from Liverpool, which is called The Third Intermediate Period in Egypt. And it was a little blue book, but it was really thick. And it was the first time that any scholar, Egyptologist, had put together all the data from one particular period of Egyptian history, which is from the 21st dynasty all the way through to the 25th. We call it the third intermediate period. Now, when I was at university, you didn't touch that with a barge pole because it was so bloody complicated that nobody wanted to teach it. So they jumped from the New Kingdom across to the sort of late late period, but ignoring this period completely. That interested me because I wondered why they were so scared to do it. And I this book came out and it was gave everybody an opportunity to look at all the data together and looking how Kitchen had constructed the chronology for those dynasties, and I could see there were lots of problems with it. So I thought, right, now, this the, where the methodology was wrong to start off with. He was writing maybe this, maybe that, and then two chapters later, it was a fact. And so he built up this sort of like skeletal framework, which is basically a sort of Frankenstein's monster. And it needed to be dismantled and reconstructed. And what I found was that scholars, even all the way back to Champollion, you know, in the sort of like the 1800s, had essentially cr- constructed a history of Egypt, which was overextended too long. And what that did is, if you can imagine a BC period, you have to work backwards, don't you, from sort of like year zero, birth of Christ, working yeah. backwards. And they have to, unlike today when we have a date, which is so many... Oops, was that crackling? It's all right. Are you crackling? Nice. It's all right, is it? Okay, so today we're all right. What are we in? 2021? That's 2021 years since year zero. We can work that out nice and easy. But going backwards in time from year zero into the BC period is much more difficult. You have to construct it all, piecing all the evidence together. And they basically stretched it out too much. It was too easy. They left lots of gaps and sort of think, oh, we'll not worry about them, then we'll fill them in later. And as a result of that, they pushed all the dates before that much, much earlier in time. So Ramesses II, for instance, is about 250 years too old compared to where you really should be in the historical timeline. Does that make any sense? Yeah, so Ramesses II would be sort of towards the end of the Bronze Age, that sort of period, wouldn't it? Well, no, it, it doesn't change the archaeology or the time periods in the sense that the Bronze Age and the Iron Age don't change because they move with the Egyptians. Okay? Yeah. Because the Egyptians are the ones who date those those levels in the sites by artifacts that have Egyptian kings' names on them. That's, so if you shift the dates of Ramesses down by 250 years, you're moving the Bronze Age down as well. That's what I get. Which is so, rather nice because what... Sorry, so what, just sorry? To, to, to be clear, so the ancient Egyptian stuff is used to calibrate this sort of timeline and that's why when you find inconsistencies in ancient history this stretches out and has ramifications for different parts of the world uh, the mediterranean world and periods exactly you've been doing a bit of reading good for you yeah it basically eliminates the greek dark age so post-trojan war 
you know, we have this 300-year dark age in, Egypt, in Greek history, which doesn't exist. It's a, a complete fake. The Greeks themselves never even heard of a dark age. It's just we've constructed one based on the fact that their dating is dated via the Egyptian evidence. So Agamemnon and the, and the Mycenaeans, for instance, are dated by the Egyptian dates, not by their own Greek dates. The Greeks don't have a chronology that can really work independently of the Egyptian dates. Same goes for the Bible. Same goes for Roman history as well. So, for instance, Aeneas, who was the last great hero of the Trojan War, the surviving Trojan, he goes off, sails off to Carthage and, you know, has an affair with Dido. But at that time, he's already 300 years old. So poor old Dido is, you know, falling in love with a 300-year-old geezer. Don't make any sense at all. Because Carthage wasn't founded until 825 BC and the Trojan War was supposed to take place in 1177 BC. Nonsense. This is something I asked Eric Klein about, the Aeneas... Uh, oh, fa- you interviewed Klein, did you? Excellent. Yeah, the Aeneas Foundation myth, and I, I, I sort of uh, twisted his arm and tried to get him to indulge me that this might have been possible. Ah, because well, it, it's, only po- it's only possible if you revise the timeline. Yeah, because a lot of these founding uh, myth, well, these stories, if you like, these cultural stories and, and founding stories, they are treated as myth, and that, and say you can say the same thing for the Bible, I guess, as well, and the, a lot of the Israelite history as well. Definitely, but the whole point is the reason why they're founding myths and they're not actually real is because the timeline's wrong. If you adjust the timeline correctly, they all come into the archaeological history. You can actually see them there. We even have documents of these people. For instance, we've got letters in the British Museum written by King Saul to Pharaoh Akhenaten. Now, that that is impossible on the conventional timeline because they're 300 years separate, the two of them. That's mind-blowing. Yeah, so, it is. Going back That's to this... My, um... my mind is completely addled. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Well, this is one thing. I'm a complete amateur, I don't, although I love ancient history and this sort of mm-hmm. this period as well. And trying to keep all these things in your head at the same time and then yeah. work them towards a timeline is incredibly difficult. Oh, you want to try working with two chronologies, the conventional one and the <laughs> new chronology. Then you get into my state, you know, I've got a brain divided in two here. I have to work with both of them. So if, when you talk to, um, say, a traditional someone who believes in the traditional chronology and we yeah. take you mentioned the greek dark age so we have mm-hmm. mycenae which yeah. which uh, during the trojan war that's or the greek uh, the bronze age collapse that seems to be correct. the end of the mycenaeans correct and then we have this gap and then we have greece yeah. now this is the same geographical area isn't it and are, 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 is it your belief that there wasn't the collapse of mycenae there was or how no, does that it, work it did collapse, but it didn't have a 300-yard dark age to follow it. So, in other words, that yes, we know there was a collapse. We know that after the Trojan War, the Mycenaeans came back to the Peloponnese and to the Greece. And then, uh, according to the Greek history, the Dorians invaded and, and burnt all these um, cities like Mycenae and, and Pylos and places like that. They all got burnt and destroyed. The problem with that is that in the conventional dating, the Dorians don't come along for another 200 years. So they can't be the guys who destroyed Mycenae. They can't be the guys who destroyed Pallas and, and Sparta. But that is what the Greek stories tell us happened. The Dorians came along and destroyed the Mycenaean civilization. But that can only happen if the Dark Age doesn't exist. Okay, And if you look at all the, the genealogies of the Greeks, for instance, the Spartan kings, they go back to the Doran invasion, and you can't get them back to that sort of dating. It doesn't work that way, because we know the dates of those kings, and we know how far back they go. So they don't go back to the, to the period we're talking about that Eric would have, you know, 1177 BC for the, for the fall of, of the Bronze Age cultures. They, they can't go back that far, the Spartan genealogies. No. This is this is very interesting because of the repercussions it has in our our whole shared heritage, our shared history, and our story as humanity. Because mm-hmm. you know, after this, well, Greek Dark Age or not, whichever side of the coin you're on, mm-hmm. well, before long you get Homer and then Hesiod, and then we're into yep. ancient Greece and then ancient Rome and then Catholic Church, and all before you know it, we're in 2021 again. This is why this is so well, important exactly. to us. It is. I mean, just take Homer, for example, because you raised him, okay? 
This is a guy who tells the story of the Trojan War supposedly 300 years after it took place, when Troy was completely destroyed and just a ruin. How could he know about the way that the Greeks dressed in their armour? How could he know all the details about the sloping walls of Troy that Patroclus tried to, to run up three times? He couldn't know any of that if it was that far apart. But if he was only a generation after the Trojan War and he could talk to the people who participated participated in it, then he could get his facts for, for his um, Iliad. Uh, so it only makes sense if you remove the Dark Age. So Homer is just a generation or so after the Trojan War, not 300 years. Yeah, it certainly makes sense when you, when like you say about you raise the detail that, that's in the Iliad. And uh, yeah, you know, unless exactly. it's a work of fabrication, but I'm guessing some of I'm guessing a lot of the details in the Iliad have been have they been proven to be accurate via archaeology and other means? Yeah, because the site is Hisalik uh, in the Troad in that northwest uh, of, of Turkey today, and and the sloping walls are there. They even found arrows penetrating into the cracks between the stones. So we know there was a great war. They found storage jars inside the city buried in the ground for people to store grain in. We know that the, the thing collapsed. We, we know civilization destroyed and was destroyed there. And then, according to the conventional dating, there was a 300-year dark age where nobody lived there, and the people who came back to live there used the same pottery as the people who left 300 years earlier. It doesn't make any sense at all. Right, so there is you know, a cultural... Um, what's the word... Um, what lack anyone? of memory? What, what, no, what like a, a continuity, a continuity of culture there's between. A, there's, yes, there's a continuity of culture. They don't lose the art of writing, which is one of the arguments with the, with the Dark Age. They don't suddenly reinvent writing again afterwards. There's there's a continuity there. There's only a very short period of collapse, maybe forty years at the most, and that is where the people are grinding their way back into something we call the archaic Greek period before the classical Greek period. Okay, so they don't forget the how to write. They don't forget how to make pottery. Uh, so all those things and the genealogies that the, the the later Greeks have only go back to a certain date. So that dark age is is a manufacture of Egyptian chronology, because what happened was... Have you heard of a guy called Flinders Petrie? Yeah. Yeah, the great Egyptian archaeologist, or English Egyptologist who was a great archaeologist. Well, he found Mycenaean pottery at Tel Alamana, which is where Akhenaten was the king. And that Mycenaean pottery matched what the Pitt Schliemann found at Mycenae. Okay, so therefore, Mycenae's been dated by the dates that the Egyptologists give to Akhenaten. That's how we get the Bronze Age pushed back by 300 years. Right, we're just, it seems to me that we're just over-reliant on the Egyptian chronology for, for Dead everything. Right. Dead right. And everything is calibrated via that. That's really well, it is, except now, of course, they have radiocarbon dating, which they use to bolster the Egyptian dates, but that's a whole other issue, uh, the problem with radiocarbon dating. It makes, it's specifically calibrated radiocarbon dating that's the problem. But if you simply work back through Egyptian history and archaeology, you do not get Ramesses II at 1279 BC, which is where Kenneth Kitchen, for instance, would put him. It's much more likely to be around um, 979, around that time. So it's about a 300-year movement downwards of his dates. And everything that goes with it then is consequential for the Bible because the biblical dates are independent. They are not dated by Egyptian dates. Yes, so this is something, a different tool we can use to calibrate. Uh, although, you exactly. know, since I was a young lad, everyone told me that it was um, a total mythology and there was no historical basis in the Old Testament. I mean, for example, I remember asking Mr. Klein... Professor Klein, rather, who was the uh, who was likely to have been the pharaoh in the, in the Exodus story, right? And he would probably have said to you, Ramesses the second, but it never happened, right? <laughs> right? That's what they do. Now, let me tell you a little sort of a circular argument, which is really interesting, right? Now, in the Bible, the very first pharaoh to be given a name is a pharaoh called Shishak. Yeah, now, Shishak is a king who, five years after Solomon's died, marches into Judah and plunders the Temple of Jerusalem in, in year five of King Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Okay, now, what the Egyptian do was, they actually say, oh, this name Shishak sounds a bit like Shoshenk. 
So they, they trundle off to Karnak and they look at this big inscription there by King Shoshank, Shoshank the first. And what hap- is that still crackling? Are you hearing those cracklings or not? Or is it just me? It's it's only for a second. It's nothing to worry about. All right, I'll keep going then. Yeah. Okay. So so what happens is then is they date Shishak Shoshank. The, they've equated the two guys to nine two five BC, which is the biblical date for the event of the sacking of the Temple of Solomon. So they use the Bible to date the founder of the twenty second dynasty, King Shoshank the first, and then they tot up all the dates of the kings before that to reach a date for Ramesses II in 1279 BC. But then they say, okay, well, we've got we got the Pharaoh of the Exodus at 1279 BC, but there's no evidence for any Israelites in Egypt at that time, and there's no evidence for a Jericho at that time. So the whole thing is a myth, what you call a foundation myth. So they use the Bible to date these events of the Exodus and the conquest and Jericho, and then they use that date, to, uh, the Egyptian evidence, to dismiss the Bible on that point. So therefore, <laughs> it's a totally circular argument. Yeah, it's, uh, so Ramesses the second was the pharaoh of the Exodus, but it never happened. Explain that. Explain that to me that it never happened. Well, because the evidence is not there. The prime site you have to go to is Jericho in the Jordan Valley. Jericho was a a, a, a ruin for six hundred years. There was no no city there at all for six hundred years, and Ramesses the second is smack in the middle of that six hundred year period, where there was no Jericho. So if there was no Jericho for Joshua to destroy, then the Israelites never left Egypt in the first place, and Ramesses the second is not the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Right. So this is the story of the is it wasn't it the marching the Ark of the Covenant round the walls of Jericho? Round and and the walls collapsed. They went up into the city. They burnt the whole city, and then. Joshua put a curse on it, which lasted 600 years. So in the middle of that 600 years, you've got Ramesses II and the Exodus in the conventional scheme. Don't work. Right. So I think it, what was it? it was one of, one of the Israeli archaeologists that said Joshua destroyed a city that wasn't even there. Right. And that's how it's imbued into the conventional chronology at the moment now. But if you take it a different way, you say, well, okay, let's go to Jericho. Let's find out when it was destroyed, and then the 600 years of with nothing there. And that is at the end of the Middle Bronze Age. It's not the end of the Late Bronze Age. That's when that city was destroyed. Right, Middle Bronze Age. Yeah. And if it's at the end of the Middle Bronze Age, then the Exodus took place in the towards the end of the Middle Bronze Age, not the Late Bronze Age. And how does that tie in with the biblical chronology? Or it does it not perfectly. Well, it, that, the, the date that the Bible gives to the Exodus is fourteen forty six BC. Okay, now, if you take those 300-year dark age out that we talked about in Greece and Egyptian history, the third intermediate period gets collapsed down, it's shorter. That means that 1446 BC is right at the end of the 13th dynasty in Egypt. That's when the Hyksos invade and the whole thing goes pear-shaped. Oh, now, this is interesting because I've heard uh, or read different ideas about the Hyksos and that they right. could have been a Semitic people. They were. They came from Canaan, no doubt about that. But what we're saying is that the Exodus took place, Egypt was crushed by it, the army was drowned in the Reed Sea, they had no defence, and, and and this is in the reign of a King Dudimos or Tutimaeus, Manetho mentions him, and then these foreigners come in in their chariots and they take over the place and there's no Egyptian army to defend the country. And there's like 150 years of oppression of the Egyptians by these foreigners. Yeah, this is an interesting uh, period of, of uh, part of this period of history, the Hyksos invasion of Egypt, and sure. it, it breaks up, isn't isn't there? There's uh, the different din- um, dynasties, might be the wrong word, well, but king- kingdom periods. Kingdoms, you have yeah. Middle Kingdom, and then and then you have the Lake, uh, the New Kingdom. In between, we have something called the Second Intermediate Period, which is the Hyksos period, and basically, it's a time when Egypt was not a unified country. That's what it basically means. Right, so did the Hyksos just have uh, Lower Egypt then? They did for the beginning. There's there's two periods of Hyksos, what we call the Early Hyksos and the the Greater Hyksos. So the Early Hyksos are the ones that come in in the first place and take over the country. And then later on we have what's called the Big Dynasty, the Greater Hyksos Dynasty, with the big names in the Pophis and Kayan and all those big guys. We're great trading kings. So they come along and they take over and they rule the last hundred and something years of this, this extended period. And they're the guys that eventually take over the south as well. And they make the Egyptian pharaohs that are living down they're the vassals 
of their lot up in the north. So they have to pay. And that's when the big war starts, the big civil war. So we end up with the Thebans eventually coming along and pushing the Hyksos out into Canaan, and they become the Philistines of the Bible. Hmm. Is there any, uh, do you think there's any link between the Hyksos rulers and other big patriotic figures in the Bible like Joseph? No, because he has to come earlier. If you think that the Exodus takes place at the end of the 13th dynasty and then the Hyksos come in, then the Hyksos are later than the time of Joseph. Joseph 215 years before the Exodus. Okay. This is where so my you, head gets boggled. It's trying to get it's fit de- all this stuff in my head. It hurts. <laughs> oh, never mind. Take a pill. Don't worry about it. We're talking about Joseph at the end of the 12th dynasty. He's a pharaoh. Sorry, he's the uh, the guy who comes in when a king called Amenemhat the Third is the pharaoh. He's a great ruler. He rules for a long period of time, and in his period there was a bad, terrible famine. So it all fits together. And so the Israelites are in Egypt for 250 years, what we call the sojourn period, which yeah. is from the end of the 12th dynasty to the end of the 13th dynasty. That's how it works. And then you have the the Hyksos period, the wandering around in in the in the Israelites are wandering around in Sinai for 40 years. They then conquer the promised land. Land. They take over, they destroy Jericho, they burn all the other cities, Hatsor and other places. And then that's the judges period that takes all the way, all the way through to the kings, Saul, David and Solomon. So that's another 480 years. That Don't forget, the Bible says that in the third or fourth year of Solomon's reign, he sets the foundation stone for the temple of Jerusalem. Temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem. So, and it's four hundred and year, four hundred and eighty years from the time of the Exodus. So you can work backwards from that date to get to fourteen forty six BC for the Exodus. Yeah. It's clear as mud. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for you, for a pro. Uh, well, no, not really. To be it, honest with it, you, I'm getting a bit old for it. It bends my head. Trying to. I used to be really me. sharp when I was younger, but I'm not so sharp now. I'm afraid. You mentioned um, so- Solomon's Temple there. Um, yeah. If there was one ancient building that you could visit in its pomp, at its at its grandest, where, do you th- where would you really like to visit? It wouldn't be the Temple of Solomon. I think it would be the Labyrinth at Hawara, one of the greatest... But Herodotus has talked it one of the most spectacular buildings ever built. And it's, it's, it's called Labyrinth for a good reason, because there were literally hundreds of courts, and you could get lost in it. Now, that was built in front of the pyramid at Hawara of Amenemhat III, the pharaoh of Joseph's time. So probably Joseph was the architect who designed the labyrinth. I would like to go in that and wander around that. I'll probably never come out again. <laughs> but, but that would be a real building to go and watch. But there are many fantastic buildings uh, in the ancient world, as we know. Well, let's not get on to pyramids, please. Why not? Oh, God, pyramid idiots and all that stuff. I don't want to get into that. Pyr- aliens pyram- building, the, building pyramids and stuff. Ancient aliens, yeah. There's a lot of wacky ideas about how oh. they were constructed. I mean, yeah. I think it's just the sheer scale, isn't it, that, that It's extremely people. impressive, but think about these people. What did they have? They didn't have TV. They didn't have the internet. <laughs> they didn't spend the whole time messaging people on Facebook or whatever. What did they do? They moved stone about. Mm. That was what they did. They moved mud and stone. They made mud bricks. They cut big stones, and they piled them on top of each other. That's because they had nothing better to do with their lives. Some of the uh, things, rather than the grand things um, that have been discovered in Egypt that interest me are these these diorite bowls, and some of them yeah. have really thin necks. They're and fantastic. Then, and it, it just boggles the mind. You think, how on earth, you know, with the technology that they had, the the craftsmanship, yeah. how on earth well, they, they made them? Why do you think the technology was necessary to do that? I mean, they had sand. They had drills, and they had water. And you can do amazing things with that if you've got enough time. You know, with some of these fantastic statues you see of Egyptians, the, the, the amount of work goes into those is astonishing. Also, remember that there was no, you never get anything named by the artist in Egypt. You'll never have a signature on anything, a statue or a, a relief on a wall or a painting in a tomb. It's not signed by anybody. They didn't have artists. They had craftsmen. Mm. artisans and each one did a different part of the process of making the art so for instance a statue would not be made by a single individual a wall painting would not be done by a single painter 
there'd be different painters doing p- different parts of it, you know, drawing out the framework for the the shapes of the figures. Another guy drawing it all, uh, correcting it all from red to black. Somebody else filling it in, cutting back the the relief, painting the final final painting on it. All those are different guys doing that. So it's a t- it's technology, but it's technology in terms of skill rather yeah. than what we have today. Yeah, a lot of the conjecture. I mean, mainly to do with the pyramids as well, is that they were built by slaves. And it, I think you, you've been, you're you more right saying that it's craftsmen, it's people who are skilled, who are pres- presumably well-paid because they're so good at their jobs. No, don't forget, the economy is not based on coinage at this stage, OK? So when yeah. you say paid, what it basically means is they're given certain things. But it, they had something called the corvée system. Basically, the king demanded that the people in the villages, the men, would young men, would come to work on the pyramid for a three-month period, usually during the inundation or what it might be, when they can't farm. But at the time of Khufu, for instance, this maniac who built the Great Pyramid... <laughs> I mean, he actually said, no, 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 no. I did this monstrous pyramid building. You ain't going back to your villages after you've done your three-month shift. You're sticking it out here, mate, and you're sticking it out till you drop dead. So you might call those slaves, although they're Egyptians, they've ch- turned from a corvée workforce to a slave workforce because he wanted this huge egotistical monument building, and he ruined the economy, him and his son. Kefren or Kafre ruined the economy, which is why Mykerinos, the third you know, king or Menkaure, built a much smaller pyramid. They couldn't afford to do it after that. And after that, of course, there were rubble-filled pyramids with an outer casing of limestone. They couldn't do the job anymore because the, con- the, the actual economy of the country had been shattered by these egomaniacs. And um, is, would you say, is it accurate to describe them as tombs? Is that, are you of the mind tombs. that that's yeah. why they were, that Pharaoh Khufu wanted it as his final resting place? Yeah, of course the tombs. And what else could they be? Don't tell me the grains. Power, uh, yeah, power plants. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. They're just egotistical monuments, and they just happen to be, bur- to be buried in them. But, of course, they were ransacked. These pyramids are ransacked by the Hyksos later. The Hyksos, when they took over the country, they used these as mining operations. They took their time to break in and steal all the stuff inside. Yeah, because I presume, like Tutankhamun, when he was buried, he would have been buried with all sorts of incredible grave goods and things to help him in the afterlife. I mean, Tutankhamun is the one that we do have preserved of what was put in these in, in these tombs, fortunately, because of the fact he was a nobody. nobody everybody <laughs> forgot about him. I mean, you know, the big tombs were the grandiose tombs like Ramesses II. It's a shattered ruin. We have nothing from inside that tomb at all, but you can just imagine the wealth of it. You know, it's all gone. Yeah. Uh, just to go well, did back... You see that, did you see that fantastic parade yesterday of the mummies going from the museum, Cairo Museum, to the new National Museum of Civilization? Fantastic, the way the Egyptians today are celebrating those amazing uh, kings. And the fact that we have those kings' bodies is just a minor miracle. You tell me of, of a, a Greek king, Agamemnon, where's he gone? Where are the Trojan kings? Where are the Babylonian kings? They've all gone. We don't see any of them. The one lot we have are the Egyptian kings of the New Kingdom. Why is that? Why specifically do we have the Egyptian kings and not, like you said, ancient well, Greeks or Romans? two things. The first, first thing is mummification. So the bodies are preserved, right? And the climate allows that because they're buried in the desert. But the second thing, and the, the most important thing, is at the end of the 20th dynasty, tomb robbers started to go into the Valley of the Kings and, and ransack some of the tombs and plunder the king's body. So the, the last kings of the 20th dynasty and the kings of the 21st dynasty decided to sort of bring all the kings together. They took them out of their tombs. They conveniently stripped them of all their gold, of course, and removed all the treasures, which, you know, is a quite a nice operation if you think you're doing it out of reverence, but actually just putting it all in your bank account. Mm. And then once they've done that, they then take them all up into a secret hiding place called the Royal Cache, and they buried them all together in there, and that was discovered uh, in, the, in the 18th century, 19th century, about the middle of the 19th century, by some, some guy called the Abdel Rasul brothers. They're the ones who found it. And the Egyptian government got to hear about it and managed to beat the hell out of these guys to get in to tell them where this tomb was and so they went and found the tomb and they found what 30 odd mummies of the royal royals of the new kingdom in there and they carted them all down to the british uh, the egyptian museum which is why we see them today 
Right. So, so were... you can look upon the face of Ramesses the second and say hello to him, but you can't <laughs> do that with Agamemnon. Right. So they were preserved by uh, by later kings. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Conveniently for them, because all the treasure was ripped away. Yeah. Well. Um, In fact, the the guy who did it. King Harry or his tomb's never been found, so it must be crammed full of treasure. <laughs> Just to go back to your your, uh, your new chronology, David, hmm? I was wondering, does this affect, as well as you mentioned the, the removal of the Greek Dark Age, Yeah, does it affect other empires of, of like the Near East, like Babylon, the Babylonian timeline, the Syrians? Okay. That's a good question. The Babylonians have an independent chronology, okay, and the Assyrians. The Mesopotamian kings do have a dating system. They call the limo lists. In other words, they, they have an annual head of uh, the government, if you like, or the, the assembly. And each year we have those lists ne- of named kings. But they only go back to about 911 BC before they start to fragment, and we don't have the entire list before that. So it's fairly secure up to about 911 BC, and after that it's a bit of a problem. So they are independent, of the Egyptians, and so there's a whole chronology that goes side by side. But of course, the Babylonians only come and the and the Assyrians only come into the Bible story much much later in in the time of King Ahab and Omri and those guys, the sort of middle of the what we call the divided monarchy period. In other words, way after Solomon. So they only play a role in dating the biblical or making synchronisms with the biblical kings in that later period. For the earlier stuff, we have the relationship between the Bible uh, or the Old Testament and Egypt to work with. That's what we work with there. Right, because we, we hear about neo-Babylonians, Babylonians yeah. and neo-Babylonians and Assyrians yeah. and neo-Assyrians. Neo-Assyrians. Just means new Assyrians, new Babylonians. Basically, there are older Assyrian groups, uh, Ashur, and of course in Babylon, in Babylon you have the Hammurabi dynasty going well back to the old Babylonian period. You know, Hammurabi was a great king and he had this fantastic library uh, of, of, of tablets which tell the, told the story of the Book of Genesis, basically. They're individual stories, but they're certainly very, very similar to what we have in the, Gen- the Book of Genesis. And presumably this where the Babylonian timeline starts to fragment uh, around 900, is that due to the collapse that Eric Klein talks about? No, not really. It's it's more to do with the fact that the eponym lists that we have are not preserved for that period in a complete list. They're a bit broken up. People try to piece it all together, and they've done a reasonably good job of it, but it's quite complex. That period is what we call a dark age in, in Mesopotamian history, too. There's a sort of a, a period where we're not quite sure about what's going on for the previous 200 years. Then it gets more solid again for the earlier period. So some some scholars in Mesopotamian history try to overlap those kings, like saying that perhaps there was more than one king's line at the same time like there was in Egypt later on as well so it's all in this dark age period when we get the confusion yes yeah yeah because I mean yeah we Eric Klein talks about this sort of G7 he calls it of the Mediterranean world where all these sort of successful civilizations are are very well connected via trade and intermarrying and politically they're connected yeah. And uh, it's like a domino effect, and they sort of it fall is. down. It, 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 that's what we call the Golden Age. Yeah. The, go- the late Bronze Age is the Golden Age, with all the kings trading with each other. They call each other brother, all the rest of it. It's a fantastic thing. And then these bloody idiot Greeks go off and attack Troy, and it all falls <laughs> to pieces. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, look, yes, there was a climate issue. Eric's absolutely right about that. What Eric's done, and it's a genius book, 1177, he's brought all these elements together, the climate, the earthquakes, the sea people's invasions, the the Trojan War, and he's brought them all together and created a fantastic story, which I'm sure is true. But what he doesn't do is explain what happened in the next 300 years. Okay, and that's the key. Is it that big a disaster? Is it so bad that for 300 years we have nothing? Or is it simply a fact we've created that 300 years to make that collapse more great than it really was? Wow, that's really interesting. Hey, you brought up, that was something I really wanted to ask you, the sea peoples. Yeah. Does, does the new chronology affect or uh, the identity, a, a potential identity, identity of the sea peoples? Yeah, 
because they are post-Trojan War, and they are certainly triggered by the Trojan War. So most of these these guys that you see in the Sea People's group are from the Aegean or from coastal Anatolia, coast, coastal Turkey. Okay, so they are post-Trojan War. They're not refugees exactly, but they're looking for something new. It's been driven by climate change. It's been driven by the Trojan War. It's been driven by the collapse of Mycenaean civilization. All those forces are at work here. And the guy who led the invasion down into Egypt, down into the in Canaan, from that period is called Mopsus. Okay, he is actually uh, a guy who was of the generation of the Trojan War. He he was a king of uh, of southwest Anatolia, okay, and he actually led them, and he's actually mentioned in texts that we find in Turkey, in Anatolia, uh, and Mopsu Hestia, a town on the eastern side of Turkey and the south, is actually named after him. It means the hearth of Mopsus. He founded it, okay, and he apparently was killed at Ashkelon, which is where approximately the Egyptians fought the Sea Peoples. So he's probably one of the leaders who was killed by the Egyptians at the time, as far as we can tell. But these people are actually migrating as a result of the collapse, but primarily because of the Trojan War and the effect it had on everybody. Do you not think any of the Sea Peoples could have been from further west? from the Italian no, Peninsula I don't, Sardinia. I don't personally. I don't put, I mean, the Shardana, for instance. Mm. The Shardana, everybody says, oh, Sardinians. Yes, but was it that they came from Sardinia or they went to Sardinia? Right. Because the Sardinia is named after them. Okay. I believe the Shardana are from Sardis in Anatolia. Right, yeah. Okay. And, what that, and that's what the, the Shardana, or that, what the people of Sardis actually say. They say they migrated westwards towards Italy. So and and we have the the DNA of the cattle from that region has been found in Etr- in, in Etruria in 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 Italy. So they actually brought their cows with them, their bulls with them, so that they could bring them to Italy. And the Etruscans were actually descended from the Sardinians or the the Shardana, and part of them went to Sardinia and became, and that was named after Shardana. Wow. So we're getting back to the sort of founding of Rome and the Italian Peninsula, then, aren't we? Absolutely. This so-called colonization movement westward, there's no big 300-year gap. It comes right after the Trojan War. Okay, so they, they fail in their attack upon Egypt, and some of them then migrate west and found Carthage in 825 BC. Okay, and that's Dido coming across from, from Tyre. Sidon and Tyre across yeah. there. And, of course, don't forget the Caesars themselves claim to have come from Troy. They're descended from the Trojans. Aeneas, okay, yeah. so... Julius is Ilos, and Ilos was the Willios, which is which is the name for Troy, Ilios, or the Iliad. Okay, so he claimed to be descended from Troy. So those first five so-called five great Caesars were actually claiming on their coinage to be descendants of the Trojans. It definitely Aeneas. definitely makes sense. You talk about people migrating from Sartis to what was known as Etruria. If you've yeah. just got sort of nomadic herdsmen living in northern Italy, for example, and then you have, a fo- you know, refugees or people escaping a more advanced civilization moving westwards, landing yeah. in what is what was known as Etruria, that there would be advantage. They would have an advantage to take over. They would probably have better farming methods, whatnot, and because they yeah. were the dominant power before, before Rome, weren't they, the Etrurians? <laughs> The exactly, and you also have Aeneas coming to Carthage and then coming up to Italy and founding a city called Lavinia. And Lavinia is the foundation of the so-called Roman kings. The Roman kings come from Aeneas. So we have the king's period in Roman history, and that, of course, is Romulus and Remus going on for there's a, about five or six kings. Then we have the Republic, then we have the emperors, okay? Yeah. So it, the empire period. So it all stems from Aeneas coming to um, to Western Italy and the Sardinians or the Shardana going to slightly further north, and, and they, they are Etruscans, and you also have them in Sardinia. So yeah, this movement westwards is all post-Trojan War. And would this be related? There was um, a sort of Greek expansion to Italy, wasn't there, before the Roman Empire? There was Greek settlements all over the Italian peninsula. Would this be related as well? 
they are related. They are they are the foundation of the Greeks moving westwards. Absolutely, and that again, there's no 300 year gap. We call it the colonization movement. So you have yeah. the Trojan War, you have a 300 year dark age, and you have the colonization movement, which is the Western movement of the Greeks and the and the Phoenicians. Okay, but if you get rid of the Trojan War, it happens. Im- sorry, you get rid of the dark age, it happens immediately after the Trojan War. Makes complete sense to me. I'm sold. Oh, it does to me too. So Eric yeah. doesn't buy it. Eric doesn't buy it because he's fixed on Egyptian technology. What, what he ha- accepts it. What has been the reception in academia to your work? It's it's a long story, really. I mean, I, I started this in the 1970s. Okay, and then uh, I did uh, sort of like the book came out and everybody went crazy. The first book, Attested Time. We had the Ferris and Kings TV series. And they all thought, ah, oh, load of rubbish. This is the academics, of course. But the rest of the population loved it. They didn't like that at all. You know, and we, I was, it, the fact that you got this cranky old Egyptologist. Well, I wasn't actually young at the time. But anyway, this, 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 this Egyptologist who got to number two in the Sunday Times bestseller list for eight weeks. And the only reason I didn't get back to number one was because that silly um, American who was writing about the stories from a small island, whatever he was called, he sat on number one spot for the eight weeks. And I couldn't get there, couldn't get to number one. But they'd never had an Egyptology book sitting at number two in the bestsellers list for that long. So they didn't like that at all. Uh, but so, yeah, so you had a lot of criticisms. Uh, the guys who were at university with me, though, PhD um, students, now professors themselves and doctors, they were quite keen on it. So the younger ones came along. And funny enough, the more senior ones, the really the ones that are now my age, that were in those days my age, um, they were actually much more open-minded. To it. it was the middle-ranking ones that didn't like it too much. Really? Uh, you know, like the, the people at the British Museum and stuff like that, they didn't like it very much. And the British Museum banned my book. They wouldn't, <laughs> they, w- they wouldn't sell it in the British Museum bookshop. They refused to sell it. So there you go. So... As I mature and as they mature and as the world matures, people are beginning, you know, to think of it's quite quite interesting, quite a novel idea. What they do do is, now what they say now is, well, all your Exodus stuff is fantastic and it all works and you found Joseph and all the rest of it. But what about the rest of it that goes after that? That doesn't work, does it? Which is why I'm now writing these books about filling in the gap between the Exodus all the way through to the, the, the kings in the Bible and the Egyptian history and trying to piece that whole thing together to show it does work for the whole period. You mentioned the new book there. Tell us about the new is, book. Is that a Guinness you've got there? It's not. It is a Tongerlo. What's oh, that? snap. Authentic. That's um, Trappist Ooh. one, isn't it? It's a, are, you, are, are, you, are you being drawn to alcohol because of what I'm talking to you about? It's genuine Belgian <laughs> Abbey <laughs> beer. Just... Oh, is it? I, you can't cope, so you're hitting the bottle. <laughs> no, wait, it's a bank holiday. Let me off. Oh, is it? All right, then. Let me is off that why I'm on yeah. today? Because it's a bank holiday. <laughs> 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 I showed you earlier on before you went on air, and you know, you've got to see this, because your your viewers must read that. Yeah, you've got to read that. Ah, there. Yes. You know, that's what it's all about, really, isn't it? Everybody, every Egyptologist has one of these mugs. <laughs> So you've had a, so you've been given a bit of a rough ride by the traditional Egyptologists. Yeah, but I'm Mancunian for God's sake. I can handle it. I think if you was... can be a Manchester United supporter. You can take all sorts of shit. No the, problems. There was a famous quote. I think it might have been Feynman who said something about uh, what was it? Science progresses at the death of a professor or something. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, there's that one, isn't there? What, I think it was Max Planck or somebody Max like him, anyway, who's, who said that a new idea, when it's introduced to academia, they first of all reject it utterly and, and take, call it nonsense. And then later on, when that generation has died off, the new generation comes along and says, well, it actually isn't nonsense after all. And that's the thing is you've got to wait for a generation to go. Look at continental drift theory. Look how long it took for that to get accepted. The, it was like 25 years or so before people started to realise it made sense. Yeah, science is very good at making small steps, but, you know, you, you have yeah. to admit that what you're proposing is a giant leap, isn't it? it? It's extremely radical, no doubt about that. And I was well aware that it was radical right from the start. I mean, one, one of the great concerns I had was that um, people wouldn't take me seriously. Um, so I went and, and so I've been doing all this research since the 1970s. So 
um, I went and actually got to university to actually get all the qualifications. So they couldn't turn around and say that I was like a, another madman, you know, because I'd done the thing. I'd yeah. done the research. I know the methodologies and all the rest of it. So I spent, well, a long time at university. And I got my BA and I went on to to do an, an MA. And then I was ne- I nearly completed the PhD. But unfortunately, what happened with the PhD was that I went and gave a lecture to the Egypt Exploration Society in London, which is the big Egyptology group in the UK. And there was a literary agent uh, in the audience. I didn't know he was there. And at the end of the lecture, I talked about the chronology and all the rest of it. And then he came up to me at the end when everybody had gone and said, uh, do you have a representation? Does anybody represent you? I said, no, I'm, I'm just a student, for God's sake, you know, doing a PhD. He said, well, will you come to my office in Harley Street? So, oh, no, it was Baker Street. I beg your pardon, Baker Street. And and um, within, what, f- eight weeks, I'd got a book, pu- book publishing contract <laughs> with Random House. I got a TV series from Channel 4. I'd got another TV series from Discovery Channel in America. They flew me over to, to meet the head of Discovery Channel, and we did a whole thing there. And I got, an, I got a number two bestseller in the charts. And so they turned around and said, well, hang on a minute. That was your PhD. You cannot, and according to the rules at London University, you cannot pre-publish your PhD. So although I was collecting nice lots of dosh for doing all this stuff, okay, they said, oh, well, if you're going to continue your PhD, you have to completely change it to another subject. That's all sort of. <laughs> Yeah, you don't. You don't really need it at that point. I didn't. I, I didn't need it. I had new book contracts. I had fulfilments. I had lecture tours and all sorts of stuff going on. So I yeah. couldn't start again. You know, doing something like uh, a book, uh, a PhD on Pharaoh's flowers or something. You know, which is what <laughs> one PhD was famously uh, labelled. There was another. There was another PhD, a brilliant PhD that I remember from an Israeli specialist who a student. She was a really brilliant student, and she did her entire five years research on scratch marks on sickle blades. Um, you know, the, the ass's jaws that were used for cutting down corn. She would. She, she microscopically analysed the blades to look at the scratch marks to find out whether the the blades were cut down with a left to right action or a right to left action that was her entire phd and when and when she pres- presented it to the to the audience i put my hand up and said what as if they're left-handed she said oh i'd never thought of that and so obviously if a left-handed person does it you can't you can't tell whether her scratches are from one direction or the other so that's what phds are well and they're really a rather strange thing phds this is one of the great advantages of modern science, but I also think it's one of our Achilles heels is this hyper specialization that we have. Sure. You and right. We need more people who are synthesizing and looking at the bigger picture and multidisciplinary multidisciplinary. That's, well, exactly. That's why I founded the Institute for the Study of Interdisciplinary Sciences. Because it's precisely that. It's bringing together specialists from different sciences, different disciplines, to work together towards trying to achieve an aim. And that's really where I am. I'm a multidisciplinarian. I'm not a specialist in any one area. So, I, you know, I know a little bit about Greek history, archaeology, Anatolian archaeology, Mesopotamian archaeology, Levantine archaeology. I did a lot of this at university. And, of course, Old Testament um, scholarship, Egyptology, Egyptian archaeology, all those things are all... And I actually did uh, also a bit of Roman as well. So I have a mixture of stuff, and I've got a broad uh, understanding of the whole thing. You need to do that to integrate it all. Yeah, because it's all connected. It is all connected, but a lot of disciplines are not connected. This is the problem, yeah. They don't talk to each other a lot of the time, although it's changing now. It didn't used to be like it is now. It used to be much more difficult to talk to a Mesopotamian scholar or to talk to a, a Greek um, a Mycenaean scholar or a Minoan scholar, for instance. Uh, you know, I remember Professor Colstrom. I used to go to his um, fantastic seminars on Mycenaean and Minoan archaeology, and they were wonderful because he was integrating the Mycenaean cultures with the Minoan cultures and seeing how they all integrated and worked together. And he was a great scholar, and still is, of course. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, yeah. which I've asked previous experts in the ancient world, and it's one of these things that nags at me, is this question of longevity in the ancient oh. world. Because a lot of people, I guess, like me, we grew up with this idea in our head that in the ancient world, everyone got to 35 and then dropped dead. 
and it seems to me that you know I, I was re um if you take Ramses the second or Sophocles, you can find mm-hmm. various examples of people living to the age of ninety. Yeah. What's your what's your view? Good. What's your view on longevity? Well, well, yeah. Well, the trouble is you then get into the thing like you know what about the patriarchal ages? You know, so all right, Joseph, one hundred and ten years. I can just about buy that, especially you have Egyptian texts that saying the perfect age is one hundred and ten years. So we actually have ancient documents saying that. So that was what people aimed for, not what they achieved, what they aimed for. And then you've got others in the Bible, you know, uh, people, the the early patriarchs in Genesis, just, you know, 900 years, Methuselah, you know. What what does that mean, for God's sakes? So it's a problem. However, you're right in the first thing you said, which is when you analyze the cemeteries, uh, in Egypt, the Roman ones and even the earlier ones, the Navaris in the Middle Bronze Age, right? The typical age that people reached, adults' age, was around 32 for men and 35 for women. Right. And that was the average, okay? And that's eliminating all the infant burials that took place earlier. So if you manage to get to 10, then you're classified as an adult. And if you look at those, well, they're talking about a typical average age of about 35 years maximum. But we do have other people that obviously lived longer than that. Well, you can't compare Ramesses II with his diet to some farmer down the road because Ramesses II was looked after. Look at our queen now. Look at her age. Look at the, you know, the uh, her husband. Look at their ages now. They're not typical. Although we are getting some people living to that age, but it's all to do with diet and how you looked after and what you have to do in life. How, how hard your life was. These guys who are living in Avaris in the Middle Bronze Age, they had a terrible life. You could tell from the bones they've been analysed. You know, they have Harris lines in them. They're they're partially starving. They're hungry. They're overworked. They are probably slaves. Mm. Okay, and they're probably Hebrew slaves. So, you know, because this is the time we've got the sojourn and the slavery period. So, yes, they will have short lifespans. I can't tell you why the Bible says, and some of the Sumerian kings lists say, that people lived for hundreds of years. I can't tell you why that is. I've no idea. No, no, it, it was more the general average farmer I'm, I'm thinking of. And what you say makes sense, that it's, it's the general hardship of the conditions that they're living in. If I went back to that period and lived in a family at that time, then just yeah. the, the daily grind of life and the yeah. lack of provision would see me off in my mid-30s more, you know. Absolutely, but if you're a noble and you have a different diet, and you're not working in the fields, you'll live a lot longer. Yeah. But it's very interesting, you see, because then you have to think about family planning. Because if your life expectancy is 35, when are you going to start thinking about children? Mm-hmm. At the age of 12, 13, 14? Yeah, you're who's going to raise, who's gonna raise 30. them? You're not going to hang around till you're 30, are you, to have children? So, you know, you've got to think about that element of it as well. So when you're thinking about how long a generation is, and don't forget, define a generation. It's, it's from your birth to the birth of your eldest surviving son. That is a generation. And you need to get that male, the surviving male to live before you pop, pop your clogs. All right. So you're starting to have children at the age of 13, 14. You may get, uh, after your ter- second or third attempt, you may get a, a surviving male heir. Okay, but then, you know, you're probably 19 at that point. You've got to raise that kid before you die. So you've got to think about those sorts of things when you think about how long a generation was. Because we have genealogies, ancient genealogies, and you've got to work out, well, what is a generation? And I reckon a generation is about 22 to 23 years maximum. It's not 30 or 40 like the Greeks would say. Um, so, you know, so you've got a, a generation that long, and if you then add them all up together, you get a chronology, or at least you get a, a general chronology of the time period using these genealogies. I suppose part of the problem is is that we have more written evid- evidence for nobles and kings and such like in, in how they lived and what maybe the yep. general standard of living is. Do we have much written evidence? You know, I'm, I'm guessing most of these farmers in the ancient world weren't, weren't even literate. No, they weren't. So when you look at Egyptian temples, what do you have on the outside walls of the temple where the common folk could go? You have the front page of the Sun newspaper. (laughs) 
Okay, so you have big paintings of the pharaoh and his chariots smiting the enemies and loads of text, <laughs> but they can't read the bloody text. They just look at the big pictures. Yeah. That's what their job is. They weren't inside. They weren't allowed inside the temples. So those those are the newspapers of the day. Those those outer walls of the temples with all these big reliefs on of the campaigns of the king, showing how pr- great they were and what who the enemy were that they defeated. That's what the ordinary folks saw. The intellectuals, the readers, they could go inside the temple. The priests and the officials could go inside the temple and read the inscriptions there, the historical records. Then they could do the reading. But, of course, then they had plays. They performed in front of the temples the events. So the king would, you know, he would bring back a few captives from a battle somewhere, and he'd grab the, the, this guy by the hair and he'd smack him on the head with a, with a mace and crush his head in. And the people would all applause. That's what the ceremonial war was for them in front. So they could get these plays, these enactments of the king doing his job that he'd done 50 miles up north in, in the Levant. Bread and circuses. Absolutely. That's what they came for. That's what they came to see. I'm sure they were doing that all the time. Did they have, like, in, in Egypt, did they have, like, an equivalent of the, the amphitheatres? Nothing like that, as far as we know. We don't have any structures like that. But they would have used the temple forecourts right. uh, in front of the pylons as their staging for the populations. So that I'm sure they had ritual killings. I'm sure that happened. Uh, the king or his officials would smite their enemies in front of crowds that they brought back from these, these battles. And presumably, would there have been, like public um, capital punishment and corporal punishment in ancient Egypt? I'm sure there was. There's no doubt about that. I mean, let's face it, the ancient world was not a pleasant place. You know, I mean, most you wouldn't want to live there because, as you say, life expectancy was pretty short. And that's another reason why life expectancy was short, because you'd end up getting killed pretty quick if you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And look at the citizens of Jericho, 2,000 of them slaughtered by Joshua and his people. You know, so it wasn't a pretty place to be, to be honest. If you were lucky enough to be a noble, you could probably have a decent life. But if you weren't, if you were in the army and you were actually, you know, part of that and you were sent off to go and fight a war somewhere, you didn't want to fight, you probably wouldn't survive that. No, it makes you wonder how people coped back in those days, even with just average day-to-day life, the fortitude. I mean, I guess it's just a, a, a basic survival instinct, is it, do you think? Well, it's that, and it's this word, life expectancy. It's what you expect. We don't expect to die at 35. We expect to die at 75, 80. So it's what you expect. If you know your life is only going to be 35 years, you live it to the the best you possibly can. You don't expect it to be much greater than that, unless you're a noble. Did did they have time for, for recreation? In ancient Egypt? What, what would they do? They used sex and drugs and drinking. <laughs> what drugs? Uh, well, I don't Asking know. Asking for a friend. <laughs> no, we, we don't know. They had beer, don't forget. Um, but, yeah, I mean, they get pissed as newts. I mean, they were really... They used to know how to celebrate. There was a festival called the Festival of Drunkenness, which is dedicated to the goddess Hathor, the mother goddess, the cow goddess, the golden cow, basically, or the golden calf she was, actually. Mm. Uh, and and they would just have debauchery for 24 hours. They'd just go bonkers with it. You know, they'd have sex with everybody else. They'd, they'd all play instruments and sing and get pissed and all the thing. And they'd wake up with a ginormous headache the next morning. <laughs> Uh, and that's what's happening with the golden calf at Sinai, because the Israelites, who were in Egypt as slaves, had not forgotten that ritual. And when Moses tried to tell them to behave, and he went up the mountain for 40 days, they ended up getting pissed and having sex in front of the golden calf, which is Hathor. Do you, um, do you think they were drinking traditional or standard alcohol, or do you think that it was spiked with psychedelics? I wouldn't know. Uh, it depends on where you get these drugs from, because don't forget, there's probably no contact with the Americas at this time. So it depends on what's available. Opium is certainly available. And we know that that was coming from Crete and places like that. So they certainly had that. But ordinary folk, as opposed to the nobles, probably couldn't afford it. So well, they're more likely just to be doing the beer and the sex, which is probably enough, to be quite honest. There was an interesting book came out, I think it was last year, or it might have been the year before, by Brian... Murray Rescue, I think he's called, called right. the, the Immortality Key. And he's been right. looking into um, the ancient mystery schools 
mm-hmm. and uh, he actually referenced Eric Klein's work at Tel Cabri because I think uh-huh. um, they found a big wine or wine cellar or something at Tel Cabri, yeah. and uh, yeah, he's he's been his book is sort of making the argument that a lot of this wine that was drunk, particularly in the mystery schools, was spiked with ergot, and it was it was oh, being wow. used wow. as a psychedelic. Right, even uh, it's entirely possible. The question is, where? You, what's your source for these drugs? That's the first thing you have to find out, isn't it? If it's if it's Mesoamerica or South America, you're in trouble, uh, unless you actually believe that there, there was contact across the Atlantic. And we don't really have any evidence to that to the Phoenicians. We we do have a Phoenician shipwreck off the coast of Brazil. Really? Carthaginian, yes, with Carthaginian amphorae stuck of, stacked inside the boat. Um, so we know the Phoenicians were actually crossing the Atlantic. God, don't forget, they went all the way around Africa in the time of Neko, King Neko of Egypt. They went, they, su- they navigated the entire coastline of Africa, came back through the Mediterranean again. They left Egypt and went all the way around. So uh, yeah, we know that they were there, and we have, and we say we have this shipwreck off the coast of Brazil. We have Roman um, terracottas in Mexico. So we do have contact across the Atlantic, but whether it can go back as early as the Middle Bronze Age or the Late Bronze Age, I'm not sure. What uh, what year was the Phoenician shipwreck in Brazil from, roughly? It's Carthaginian, so we're talking probably oh. about 7th century, something like that, Seven, maybe 6th century. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's sort of, again, you're growing up with this, you know, you're taught in school that Christopher Columbus discovered oh, America, you know. The Irish were there long before that. <laughs> and the Vikings. And the Vikings, of course, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So no, 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 no. Don't forget you've got currents that take you. You can literally go from uh, the coast of Africa or the Straits of Gibraltar, and it could take you on a southern route and all the way across to, to, the, um, to the Gulf of Mexico. No problems. You just follow the current. Yeah, you just need to see. And, and you the return craft. on the Gulf, the Gulf Stream coming back the other way. <clears throat> So I don't have a problem with that, but whether you could take it as back as far as the Bronze Ages, I'm not quite sure about that. Yeah. So it would depend on what your source is for the for the materials, for your drugs. <laughs> well, um, tell us about your new book before we go, because we've gone over an hour already, David. You've got All a new right. book yeah, coming well, out soon, haven't you? Yeah, the new book, I've just finished it. Uh, I just finished the proofreading, which took forever. It's basically a continuation of my last book. So the last book was called Exodus, Myth or History, and that did the sort of Exodus all the way through to the Conquest, basically. So that was a big book that was published in the States, very popular. Uh, and this is the continuation. Now, although I do a refresher on what happened in the in the time of the Sojourn and Exodus and Conquest with new material that's come up in the last two or three years, it then continues on through the Judges period all the way through to the time of Saul. That's the first volume in this two-volume volume book, uh, and it gives you all the archaeology and the connections between the archaeology and the Old Testament Egyptian history to link them all together. Then the set, volume two, which is going to be, I've nearly finished it, that's going to be coming out a little bit later, uh, that one goes from the time of King David all the way through to the sack of the temple by the Babylonians. Uh, in Jerusalem. So it will take the whole of Israelite history and looking at the archaeology in this new chronology, this new timeline that we've created, looking at where the synchronisms are, which kings were which, who was the pharaoh whose daughter married King Solomon, for instance, is a question that's addressed it, that type of thing. I'm looking at the archaeology. Now, they're all colour books, so they're hardbacks, they're 416 pages in size, they're on art paper, they've got like 350 coloured pictures in there, diagrams, charts, maps, the works, uh, lots of great photos. And so it's a book where you can see the evidence for yourself. I don't believe in writing a book without showing the evidence to the people who are reading the book. So those two books will be out probably in the next within the next 12 months. Um, and the only trouble is they're probably going to be published in America. Right which is a bit difficult then for the Brits to get hold of copies. But then, of course, we've got the e-books, so people can get a Kindle version or a Mac version of those same books, and they get all the full colour in there. So if you can't order the book from the States because it's so expensive to push it over... It will... Ooh. It's a ton. Oh, it's just, um, uh, then it's, it's probably... I think it's back. He's, your camera's frozen, but... Are you still there, David? No, <laughs> I think he's gone. Well, we've just wrapped up over an hour. Frozen. Oh, right. there we go. Oh. Are we back? Yeah, your camera's frozen. Are we back yet, kids, your camera's. Fr- oh, you're back. I think you're back. Oh, 
Mike, your camera's frozen too, so you're all looking very ah. still to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can hear you again. That's the okay. main thing. Yeah, you're, you're all looking frozen in time to me. You're all look like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, it's gone. oh, there oh, you go. There We're you back go. again. Oh, Should we go. start again then? Should we start at the beginning again? <laughs> yeah, so, so this, re- this new chronology, David. <laughs> yeah, now listen, why are we not talking to the other two guys? They've not done anything. Because um, we just listen. Yeah, we're learning. Oh, that, we're... But you do that. Yeah, well, you do that all the time. Then come on, ask me some questions. We don't care about the time. How long is this thing supposed to run for? An hour. <laughs> oh, can it? It can run a bit longer than that, can't it? At least ask me one question, for goodness' sakes. Yeah. I know you've had a big dinner for your Sunday roast today, but come on. Oh. <laughs> I suppose the question that kind of comes to my mind is. Yeah. Um, I think you kind of hit upon it, really, when you're talking about sort of, um, you know, it takes a generation before a new idea is accepted. Yeah. yeah. So do you think a lot of the reason why um, the new ideas aren't accepted is because people's careers are on the line kind of thing? Yeah, of course it is. Um, people who are in universities don't want to start taking on and agreeing with very revolutionary ideas. And this is revolutionary, isn't it? You've got to admit, it's radical. Okay, Mm -hmm. universities aren't radical places. Okay, perhaps in science they are. Mm -hmm. In science you can be radical, but I don't think you can in the arts, especially in history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, there are some arts you He's just breaking up again. He didn't explain it. He's he's on the top of a mountain somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) If you want to... Oh, no. Half in half art. But uh, to rock books. And I'm going to be... He's ever accepted. There we go. (laughs) I think he's back. (laughs) Yeah, we've just got some some connection issues, but... Not to worry. Give it a minute. Yeah. Considering, like, we've been online now for about a year, we've had we have not really had any catastrophic failures with the technology. Well, well yeah, I have now. I know what it is. It's Eric back over in the <laughs> states. He's messing around with the internet. Uh-huh. He's at the control. Oh, actually, Eric's a great bloke. I actually went and had a debate with him in Washington. Uh, on this whole thing and he was really charming and, and a really really great scholar so we had great fun debating in front of a huge audience but the only trouble is he got two mates along with him so it was three against one <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not very sporting no it wasn't exactly he had one Hebrew scholar Hebrew textual scholar he had one Egypt Egyptologist and of course he's a classical historian as well so I was up against it but I, I reckon I did quite well anyway so um they couldn't. The only thing they could come up with is radiocarbon dating. It wasn't anything else that they could actually uh, challenge me on. But anyway, it was great fun, and he's a lovely bloke. Yeah, definitely. I think the other thing as well is like what we sort of talked about there is that if he's to, I think he's still employed by the university, isn't he? I assume he must have. Is it called tenure? You know, where you can kind of get away with saying yes. Yeah, he's a he's, a, he's at um, George Washington University. Yeah. in Washington D.C. Yeah, but I mean, he's very open-minded, actually, mm. is Eric. They're a lot, much, much worse than he is. Um, and, he, and he's prepared to listen. And in fact, he actually bought my last book and read it, daft bugger. <laughs> so, you know, so yeah, he, he doesn't he doesn't mess around. And one of the biggest problems I have with scholars is they don't know what my work is. Right. They, you know, they don't mm. actually read it to find out what it is. But at least Eric did that. You know, and that's great that he did that. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to convince people to have their minds... Uh, set really, it's quite difficult. But I mean, you know, what, what you know, what's that? I, you know, sticks and stones and all that. It doesn't really matter to me. What matters to me is I'm reaching the people and uh, the people who are really interested in the subject area. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that's it. Say, I, you don't have to change the minds of academics, do you? Really, if you're reaching the the minds of the people. Well, that's absolutely right. But look what happened to Jesus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, we're, we are at the right time of year for that, aren't we? Good Friday yeah. through to Easter Sunday. But, you know, you, you can you can rile the authorities. Thank God these days they don't crucify people. But, uh, they do it in a literary sense. Yes. Yes. 
Do you know yeah, I mean, you know, they, 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 I would never get, a, for instance, I'd never get a, a paper published in a in a in an academic uh, journal or anything like that. It's not going to be possible. Mm. But you know, that's the name of the game. You just have to play the game. I suppose then, you know, when you mentioned right towards the beginning as well, that there's evidence in the British Museum between sort of correspondence between two kings would kind of be unexplainable without um, Sol and someone else yeah. on the Egyptians. Yeah. So it what's what's yeah. the explanation? What's their explanation saying that that's okay? Well, yeah. what, the really famous sort of doyen of Israeli archaeology is called Israel Finkelstein, Tel Aviv University. He's the great, you know, the great archaeologist of Israel. And he and and what I've done is that I've made the time of the the Amarna period of Akhenaten in the same time as King Saul. So that's because of the new chronology revision, right? But in the conventional dating, they're 300 years apart. So Israel Finkelstein writes this great article which basically says that Saul is the last... Labaya, and Labaya is the name of the king who is actually Saul in the Alamana letters. So he's actually saying they're exactly the same, Labaya and and Saul, but they're separated by 300 years, so they can't be the same person. Well, I've said, well, if you take the letters of Labaya and you learn what he's having to say, it matches exactly the story of, of Saul, and he's fighting against the Philistines. The details are so amazing that they both die in the same place in this in a battle. They both have sons who who are consorting with the Habiru, the Hebrews, and that's David and Jonathan. Jonathan is Saul's eldest son and crown prince, and he ends up uh, going and working with David, the rebel, the Hebrew rebel. So the stories fit beautifully, and, and the texts are identical, and the territories that they rule over are identical, but of course Finkelstein cannot make them the same person mm. because he, he believes they're 300 years separated between them. So they kind of just saying that it's a coincidence then? That yeah, those they're basically saying, really... what a remarkable coincidence is what they're <laughs> yeah. you know, so, so it is remarkable, but it's actually the same buggers. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so you've got, I mean, La Baia. All right, doesn't sound much like Saul, does it? But this name Saul, for instance, is actually, is actually a traditional name for him. It's not the name he was born with. Because it means asked for, because he was the king asked for by the people. You know, they went to Samuel and said, we want a king like all the other nations. So he was asked for. So that's a traditional name. That's not the name he was born with. The name he was born with is Labaya, which means the Lion of Yah. And Yah is the short form of Yahweh. Wow. So, and, and Solomon, Solomon's name means peace. That wasn't the name he was born with. He was called Jedediah. Okay, but it was given to him later. So these kings, David might have actually had a name that was his name, although his name was probably Dadua or something like that, or Dude, and that that means the beloved, the beloved of Yar or whatever it might be. So he might have actually got a name that stuck, but the other two, their names, their original names, were actually not the names that we get in the Old Testament today. But the events in their reigns are the same. Fascinating. Oh, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. You, look, you all look exhausted. You probably run out of beer, for starters. Yeah, I'm ready for a refill. Well, I'm yeah. drinking rum tonight. <laughs> so, have you finished with me, or do you want some more? I was, well, I think we should let you go. We've, we've done an right. hour and 15 minutes. We don't want to take yeah. up too much of your time, time David. Yeah, I must admit, I feel a bit lethargic today. And normally, I'm much brighter than this. I'm sorry, Lowe's. I've been a bit slow. <laughs> you saying you've always to... come back, oh, no. David. <laughs> yeah, he's you... come back. Yeah, you'll have to come yeah, back. Well, yeah, yeah. It, 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 invite me back anytime you like. You can talk about whatever you like. If you want to talk about early Christianity or the Holy Grail or anything like that. Uh, yeah. Know, or, the, or the music <laughs> industry. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to know all the secrets about the music industry, the dirt and all the rest of yeah, it, yeah. you know, just bring yes. me back and I'll talk about it, okay? Absolutely. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks for your time, David. Uh, we'll, it's all right. It's my, my pleasure. It's, it's nice to have some northerners to talk to for a change. Where's, where's, the, where's the best place for people to follow you and follow your work? Oh, I don't want to have silly websites and stuff like that. So you can just join me on Facebook if you want to keep up with what the news is. I've got the most fantastic cruise coming up now, cruise from Cairo all the way down to Luxor, looking at all the stuff that people nom- normally don't get to see. And that's, that's wonderful. That's going out next year, um, which is good fun. And I also do a lot of cruises, you know, big ship cruises. So I do lectures on them. So if you've got loads of money <laughs> and, you, and you don't mind going on, on the sea or on the Nile, then you can join me on those and you can have some proper lectures, not this nonsense but real lectures <laughs> with loads of visuals. I mean, I haven't shown you any visuals. You've just, we've just been chatting. Oh, 
Yeah. So, and by the way, you need to you need to change that wallpaper. It really is very very weird on the screen there. It's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be back in the studio soon. So, yeah, I'd, I'd get a paintbrush out and paint it a nice blue or something if I were you. Don't tell my wife that. Oh dear, she'll have, uh, she'll probably slap me if I ever meet her. Yeah, uh, you're you're in the dugouts big time, David. Yeah. Yeah, all right. right. Anyway, so yes, guys, it's been great fun. You've been a, a laugh, so that's that's interesting. It's nice to have a laugh occasionally, isn't it? No, it's we're been, all locked down. Yeah. It's Head been it's in. been great to meet you, David. Yeah, oh, my pleasure. Mm-hmm. And uh, just stay on the line for us while we play ourselves out. And um, sure, we'll put the links in the description if uh, you know for some of your books. People want to follow your work. And, right. uh, and you look forward that, to have you? I'll find it. Don't worry about that. All right. Okay. <laughs> and uh, All right. we'll look forward to the new book coming out soon as well. Yeah, and uh, best, best in, of luck with a few that. months. All right, there's plenty of second-hand books on Amazon. Don't yeah. worry. Once people are ready, they don't want to read them again. Okay. All right. Thanks <laughs> for your time. We'll be back Take in a care. flash. Don't touch All that right. dial. Bye. Take care. Bye.